I'm your host, Kali'i Aquino, president of the Grassroot Institute. Hawaii, sadly, is losing some of its greatest talent as thousands of individuals and families leave the islands every year. At the Grassroot Institute, we've chronologued their stories in a series entitled, Why We Left Hawaii. Many people are leaving because of the cost of living, and one of the things we hear most often is the price of housing. Many are also leaving because of government policies, regulations, and taxation. It's my privilege today to welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii a dear friend who has been on the program many times in the past. Today's guest is Dr. Panos Privadoras, one of Hawaii's leading public intellectuals. Uh, in October of 2022, he left Honolulu. Let me say that again. In October of 2021, he left Honolulu, which has been his home of 31 years for, shall we say, potentially greener pastures. Panos is the former chairman of the University of Hawaii Civil Engineering Department. He's an expert and leading critic on the Honolulu Rail and other transportation matters. And he's even run for mayor of Honolulu. That's been the level of his commitment to build a better Hawaii. We welcome Panos to the program again. Panos, uh, all the way from Reno, Nevada, aloha and welcome back to the program. Aloha, Kelly. Good to be here. Well, it's good to see you. How are you faring up there in Reno? So far, so good. We we like it. Uh, the, the the kids are liking their schools. Uh, my my uh, my daughter is a student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and my son is in a private school. He switched from Midpac. He was at the Midpac in uh, in Honolulu, and uh, yeah, we're quite happy. The winter wasn't severe, at least at the 2021-2022 winter. So uh, so far, so good. Now, Panos. You lived in Hawaii for 30 years or more, and your, your spouse is a lifelong resident of the island. What is it that took you away from Hawaii? Um, well, actually, you know, as I was quite engaged with the uh, political and the happenings in Hawaii, political life and the happenings. And uh, uh, for the last uh, 15 years of the 30, um, I became a, increasingly disillusioned, uh, not, not by the, the, the rail. We can talk about the rail, obviously, that was, uh, to me, a very obvious wrong decision. But then one wrong decision does not really change the whole picture. There were so many wrong decisions, uh, a litany of which that actually, I, I, after that, I said, you know, enough is enough. What is an example? Uh, we're an island state, and as you know, originally I come from Greece. We have hundreds of islands. We have hundreds of ferries. We established the super ferry and we killed it. Um, in my opinion, we have one of the best uh, energy production solutions, geothermal. The Philippines does, Iceland does, mainland does. Actually, literally, where I am right now at home, 15 miles from here, there is a big geothermal plant, actual plant producing about 60 megawatts, twice the size of the Puna plant and the same company, actually, Orma. Uh, so um, that's uh, as a beginning of you know many of the uh, many many reasons, uh, and 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 the big umbrella of it is actually again uh, the poor energy policy we have that I believe will affect the long term health of Hawaii. And what scared me as a resident in Pacific Heights, I have seen several hurricanes come, and for 31 years, and actually well, I should say for 100 plus years. Oahu has been so lucky. We have never had a direct hurricane uh, hit. But it is a matter of time. Of course, it may have happened this uh, summer, but it may happen a thousand years from now. We never know. Well, However, we're not prepared. As an engineer, I have seen the situation uh, on Oahu, and I'm quite scared about uh, the lack of preparation to deal with it. And what is that going to mean for the health and well-being of our residents. If well, a major Panos, report, something like what happened in, in Kauai, copy paste it to Oahu. My God, I mean, it, uh, the consequences can be uh, tremendous. Well, you have gone through quite a litany of public policy decisions that you evaluate as not being optimal and having great yeah. harm upon the people. What is at the root of all of this? Uh, is this a case of people in power trying to do evil? Or is there some deeper issue really at stake? Why is it, in your opinion, that Hawaii over and over 
makes bad decisions when it comes to public policy issues that affect the masses? I think the types of politics we have um, is not amenable to a technocratic solution. Uh, clearly, both, both of the parties are not really particularly technocratic. Uh, but uh, particularly when you turn leaning towards the left, technology solutions are not seen as, uh, as um, you know, particularly when they are more individual in nature, such as, you know, a toll road versus rail. Uh, in the area of, of, uh, in the area of uh, energy, uh, thanks to, to Al Gore and that, that type of thinking, which is in many ways uh, appropriate. I mean, there, there are climate issues that we need to address. However, Hawaii is so tiny and so small that it needs to have an energy policy that is reliable because, you know, unlike where I am now in Nevada that we can connect, to uh, Utah or California in case of emergency and get some extra power, there is no such, uh, such connection for Hawaii. So again, if a hurricane happens, uh, if another emergency happens, our energy supply has to be of, that, of the name of high reliability. And we all know that wind and solar is not highly reliable systems, particularly under adverse weather conditions. And you know, our mandate is to go 100% renewable. I cannot think of a more suicidal decision than that. We often hear the word sustainable, sustainable energy, energy from the sun, energy from the wind, energy from the ocean. But you're using a word that doesn't appear in the media very often or doesn't come from the lips of our public policy makers, which is reliable. And right. uh, obviously, there's some tension there between sustainable energy and reliable energy. Um, how do we resolve that tension? Uh, certainly, there, there are virtues to pursuing sustainable energy, but we also need the, the pragmatism of having a reliable energy source according to the, the kinds of things that you've just cited. How do you resolve right. that tension? And, and in fact, you know, uh, uh, to, his, uh, to his credit, Governor Ike several times uh, mentioned these targets and it says, he said that, you know, well, we're going to look for them if they are reliable. You know, however, uh, the, the, rest of, uh, uh, the rest of the politicians there did not understand his engineering conservatism and the fact that reliability should be number one priority, like in transportation safety is the number one priority. Same thing, reliability. Our hospitals need to have reliable electricity for 10, 15, 20 days, whatever it takes for the military and extended external health to come help Oahu uh, or Maui, the highly populated islands, uh, islands, if a major disaster happens in the form of, you know, tremendous inundation of uh, power plants from uh, a tsunami or a major hurricane uh, uh, hit, etc. So um, I don't see this preparation. I don't see the plants being hardened. I, uh, they are talking about, you know, dismantling the coal plant. Clearly, on the earth, if you are China, if you are India, if you are US mainland, yes, we need to start phasing out of coal. But Hawaii needs reliable base load. And if coal is affordable, I mean, yes, you have to turn a blind eye and have a good reliability number one and maintain coal as a way of having reliable electricity instead of doing a solar farm or a wind farm that actually could be almost totally destroyed by strong wind. Uh, so it's not only that you have it and then the batteries are not going to last more than 10 hours. The actual plant, because of the way that it's made, uh, will collapse. And then we're not going to have the energy we need to provide for the health and safety of our population. It sounds as though you're saying our government leaders have not been responsible in ensuring the welfare of the public as we go forward in terms Clear. of the safety of the island. That's correct. That's correct. Well, that's a significant charge. Is that one of the reasons that motivated you to leave? Perhaps. Well, uh, absolutely. Be between the combination of the wrong energy decision combined with the risk of a major national, uh, natural disaster in Hawaii, uh, it's, a, it's a big threat. For me, I, I, I saw risk and they don't try to mitigate it. So when you don't mitigate risk, eventually it might hit you and that hit may be, uh, you know, terrible. Well, that's very interesting. So you left the islands in part 
out of concern for the safety of your family. That's correct. That is correct. And uh, serial decisions were going in the wrong direction all of the time. I mean, there, even as I mentioned, the super ferry is actually, particularly if we had two or three or four of them, it is a vehicle of reliability because, uh, well, Hawaii is a small place. It's, it's uh, the various islands we have. Well, like it happened in the past, uh, we're probably going to be lucky enough when we are unlucky to have a hurricane that only one island will be hit, the others will be nice and healthy. Well, if you had a healthy ferry system, then the outer islands or whatever, the healthy island will help the sick island. It's actually a reliability and, a, and an alternative mass transportation means. Uh, it could quickly go to the mainland and bring critical supplies along with military ships, etc. So what, one evidence of government doing nothing is our harbor. Our harbors are absolutely not prepared to deal with a major surge from a hurricane or a major surge from a tsunami. Our harbors will be a complete mess. There will be uh, cranes that they toppled and there will be containers all over the place. So when the Navy arrives and ready to help after a couple of weeks from say, San Diego, there will be nowhere for them to dock to come and help. Nobody is preparing plans to have resilience in our harbor. Similar things about the airport, very basic thing. Uh, they, they are doing the basics. They have the telephone calls and all, but, but really what needs to be done is not done. I talked with several folks from Guam. I mean, the level of preparation of Guam and the level of preparation of, of Hawaii is like one. One is at one and the other is at 10. It's, it's just, you know, uh, we need to get a lot of lessons from elsewhere and we're not getting them. We're not investing in minimizing the risk of natural disasters in Hawaii. It would seem logical that we would be concerned about natural disaster here in Hawaii. We, we are the most isolated island archipelago on the planet. We have special assets, of course, the beauty of the, the land, the ocean, the people, but we also have certain liabilities that you don't have elsewhere on the planet. Why is it that our government leaders are not focused on this as an issue? What's going on in our political system that prevents the kind of focus that is necessary for the safety of the people? Well, that's, that's a malaise that exists almost everywhere politically because politicians really do not take in one to 2% risk very seriously and plan to invest big money in that. Uh, however, unfortunately, uh, bad luck there really catches up with these things, and uh, we really need to protect the population. So, um, obviously, we cannot over-invest in a wall, in, put a giant wall around Oahu, etc. But a prudent preparation needs to be made, and hardening of the harbor, for example, in the airport, should exist. And what we have is extremely basic, and an, an additional level of investment has to be there. Uh, we need to have significant retrofitting inspections of our of our houses because we cannot even uh, we cannot even uh, uh, what do you call it um, uh, <laughs> what uh, evacuate evacuate in the mainland when you have a threat you evacuate you take your car you can take buses what have you the rail you evacuate you leave the you leave the area where the disaster is happening like it happened at Yellowstone a week ago. The population was evacuated. You cannot evacuate Hawaii. It's a very special situation. It's like a fire on a ship. Typically, the population, you know, on Earth, when there is a fire, goes away from the fire. On a ship, when there is a fire, everybody goes onto the fire to get it out because it's going to sink the ship. That's what it is. I mean, in Hawaii, the conditions are so special, and we keep talking about the special, special situation we have in Hawaii, but we are. The politics are very, very, you know, mainland style. Uh, the level of risk is not the same. We really need to adapt our, poli uh, our politics and our priorities to the fragile situation we have in Hawaii. The risk is small, but it's non-zero, and there is no redundancy at all because there is nobody around. When you were in Hawaii, one of the issues about which you were the most vocal is the Honolulu Rail. And we have done programs on this issue and talked about That's it right. quite a bit. Um, I, I'm not so much interested in going through all of that right now. I want to ask you something very specific. In light of what you have just been saying about Hawaii's lack of preparation for potential catastrophic disaster, 
how does that factor into what, the rail and, and its future construction and operation? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, and I should tell our audience I, I never, I never send you questions or anything because you hit it spot on. And actually, the both times that I ran for mayor, 2008 and 2010, I did have a bullet addressing that question: What is the difference between the rail and the reversible high occupancy and tall lanes? 20 lanes of uh, 20 miles of rail versus 10 miles of what I was proposing, the reversible high occupancy and tall lanes. Well, in case of a disaster, uh, the high occupancy tall lanes immediately they can serve as a backbone for emergency services to reach uh, the, um, the various places on Oahu, from central Honolulu all the way to central Oahu and beyond, leeward Oahu. The rail, well, every hurricane we had in Florida and Texas, the rail systems, either they did okay, but in their majority, they shut down for several days or weeks. So instead of being an asset to the community, it was actually a liability because they, they had to spend significant resources to sort it up and make it back operational. Uh, a, a reversible elevated highway would have no problem at all. It's just a concrete bridge on which ambulances and bulldozers and graders and trucks that they were you know, uh, sent by the government or the military to provide cleanup services and what have you. It would have been a, a major asset in dealing with a, with, with a disaster. Again, another wrong decision that uh, wouldn't have helped. So both the rail and the super ferry, the, the super ferry is, of course, a good alternative, as I said, uh, of uh, supplying islands, et cetera, but it doesn't exist anymore. And the rail is going to be a dead asset in case of, uh, of, a, of an emergency. And remember, of course, if you have an issue that uh, one or more power plants are down, what is going to be your priority? Run the rail? No. Run your hospitals, run your traffic signals, run, you know, the, the basic health and safety infrastructure that we need. And the rail will left to languish for weeks until, you know, electricity is back up. Well, let, let's switch back to what we talked about earlier on, your own exodus out of Hawaii. Right. Do you feel safer now, Panos, you and your family? Yes. Um, there, there is risk everywhere, right? And uh, this, uh, the, the last summer we got, well, somewhat of a scare because uh, California had two of its largest historical fires that they really didn't come close to Nevada, but uh, we had a lot of smoke and a lot of pollution and it, it hit home that, you know, uh, this is a forested area, you know, Lake Tapo is all a forest. So uh, unfortunately, because of the drying up of the, of the area and the aridity, uh, and the lack of uh, water and precipitation, there is significant uh, uh, risk for fires, uh, not necessarily in my backyard, but in the general area. Uh, and of course, we're not too far from Yellowstone. There is earthquakes and there is volcanic activity. So right. as we said, there is risk everywhere, but uh, there is so much redundancy here. I mean, and if you see the threat, uh, <laughs> and it goes with Hawaii too, why it's congested if you try to if you try to evacuate you know we had a tsunami people try to evacuate out of Waikiki, and the gridlock was unbelievable people literally got stuck in their car for an hour and couldn't get off of Kapahulu or uh, off of Kalakau. here the roads do work i mean the, the lane we, there is a sufficient number of lanes and for the population and the, the the road network works the level of congestion is tolerable to low so that's actually quite pleasant Panos, how about your quality of life? Now that you live in Reno, Nevada, uh, what are you experiencing in terms of prices, access to commodities, uh, the ability to uh, establish the lifestyle that you want, and so forth? Uh, in this respect, uh, the difference is very significant, uh, particularly in a few places like um, Nevada and Texas, for example, come to mind, we don't have income tax at all. so. Uh, uh, we don't lose that 10% off of our income. But then the commodities are much more affordable. Uh, I was joking with a friend on uh, Facebook that she went to Safeway and, and got you know corn at the price that you mentioned. And it was such a great sale to get. And this is the standard price in Nevada. It's not a sale. That's the same price for the, for the item. 
And uh, not only the items are cheaper, but uh, particularly for food items and, say, and basic clothing, uh, the tax is zero. So you don't have a sales tax. So uh, they, these things begin to pile up. I and mean, then you, you save not on income taxes and uh, services and all, and of course, you leave the, the shipping charges and the, and the equipment. Um, well, we're particularly blessed here in Arizona because Amazon has a lot of warehouses. And in fact, it is possible a few items to receive them same day or in the morning of the next day. This is unheard of in Hawaii. I mean, I was always, uh, you know, uh, a good shopper on Amazon. And uh, well, you have to wait sometimes up to a week in, in Hawaii and uh, pay shipping charges, even if you're a prime member, if the item is very big or it doesn't ship to Hawaii. And no such limitations here. And so these things um, accumulate. And of course, in Hawaii, if you want to travel, see the world, well, well, airline tickets are pretty expensive. Uh, so from here, where I am in my household, I'm, uh, you know, our beloved destination from for Hawaii people, Las Vegas. Well, my wife and I just take the car and, uh, you know, we share three, uh, three hours of driving each and uh, 150 bucks in gasoline, and we are in Las Vegas. And we have a car to boot, so we don't even have to rent a car. So th there are things like that that um, obviously uh, are very pleasant. Well, as you know, in Hawaii, a lot of people are finding it difficult to afford the housing that they need, whether it's right. in the rental market or purchasing a home. Talk to me a bit about the housing market where you are. Oh, I, I'm in a place that it's actually probably worse than, than Hawaii. That surprised me very much. Uh, the, the Reno is a very strange place. Strange is not probably the right word, but we are neighbors to San Francisco. So now San Francisco, as you know, along with a few other spots in the U.S. and Honolulu are among the most expensive. And the problem with San Francisco is that those guys are four to five million people. So even if one to two percent of them decide to leave, uh, it's a lot of people. So uh, we actually had a very hard time to leave finding, not only finding a home, purchasing it. Uh, because just to throw out some numbers, you make an offer, eight hundred thousand with you know fifty percent cash and what have you. Here comes the Californian. 900,000 cash. So uh, essentially, the, the, all of the time we kept losing houses uh, under our nose with a substantial cash offer from the quite affluent folks in the, in the in, so from San Francisco and other places. So the Reno is a desirable area, etc. So uh, we had significant, uh, significant difficulty and the prices are not low. So uh, a decent house similar to the one I had in Hawaii, let's Let's throw out some numbers that that house was $1.4 million. The same house here would be $1.1 to $1.2 million. So it is in the same bracket. Uh, this place is not like a Florida and some places in Texas where half a million dollars go, goes a long way. Half a million dollars here does not buy anything really. Well, not everybody leaving Hawaii is moving to Reno. Uh, they're no, they're, they're going to Henderson. Henderson is very affordable. That's outside Las Vegas. That's a bargain for a real estate. So there's the access on the mainland to housing that fits one's budget. If you oh, very know. much, very much, yes. Now, and there are so many places, right? I mean, it's not only Henderson. The whole United States, the whole South is quite affordable. Phoenix is very affordable, quite a few places in Florida. And I'm talking about places with the similar climates too, you know. We have, Montana is affordable, but it's very hard probably for a Hawaii person to move to Montana. Well, people are definitely looking at their pocketbooks and they're voting with their feet. Since 2016, 22,000 people have left the Hawaiian Islands. These are locals yeah. who otherwise would be here were it not for concerns over the cost of living for the most part. What is the impact of such growing numbers is leaving the islands. So in what way does that impact life in Hawaii? It, it, it is very deleterious. It's very negative. Uh, obviously, we have the problem that it's almost nationwide that we have a labor shortage. So if you have people moving out, your shortage becomes even worse. But then there are certain professions, particularly out of those 22,000 people, uh, quite a few of them, if they're skilled construction workers, if they're nurses, if they're teachers, my goodness, that is very, very deleterious for the for the society, because you know people who, who contribute and they have significant and key jobs, um, 
you lose them and then it's very hard to replace them. We've talked about a lot today and I didn't want to talk only about the rail uh, because you have so much more to offer in terms of your insights and observations. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you just a few questions, if you don't mind, before we sure. leave. Um, as a prominent critic of the rail, uh, you made it clear that you were not happy with what you saw. And uh, what were your thoughts about the plan to stop short of Ala Moana for the purpose of saving on cost? It, it's definitely a step in the right direction, but it's not enough. Uh, they should have had the guts to stop it at Middle Street, and they probably will be forced to do something like that because now, we have the other gift, inflation, right? So when you budgeted $1 billion for construction, well, that was a year ago. It's probably 1.2 billion already and climbing. So they will not be able to go close to downtown. Although, you know, I know Mayor Blangieri really wants to, uh, to go as close Kakako uh, or even finish the line. Unfortunately, uh, international events and particularly the cost of energy uh, have made construction now very expensive. And they really, I mean, Honolulu, for the sake of the budget, they need to cut their uh, losses and try to finish the rail around Middle Street uh, for, uh, for, you know, saving the budget and start operating the system. So people, after paying all these years, they can start having some rail service to use. You know, Panos, one of the crucial assumptions behind making the rail project work has been that people will actually ride it. But you've seen what has happened to the projections for ridership. They've fallen in from 2015 at 119,000 weekly to the projection of 84,000 weekly now, and the numbers continue to go down. What do you think about these projections? I think they're like their cost estimates, they're optimistic. Uh, I have a blog that I post, a blog post that I post several years ago estimating that. If they open the original line as they established it, uh, they would get about 50 to 60,000 riders. And that's the unfortunate thing that eventually our city, the city of Honolulu, will pay $12 billion and then serve only 50 to 60,000 trips a day. What can I tell you? Lose, lose. Well, what do we do now? We, we, we drive around the island, we, we see. The, the structures of, of, of the rail lines uh, were pretty vested in the project and so forth. W what counsel would you give to our political leaders at this stage as to what to do with regard to the rail? Well, the best thing, as I mentioned, is to uh, actually, uh, Governor Ige had a pretty brilliant idea of uh, using the old triple C, you know, our prison, we have it's a super block that is and the, the prison we have, the jail there is, is very outdated. It has a lot of issues. So relocating it somewhere and using that super block for revitalizing part of, uh, part of Kalihi. And that area can use actually the first floor could become a good intermodal center with rail stopping there. And uh, so that then it becomes a good working system. And then start focusing finally on congestion. Oahu is very congested, so they need to work on solutions for actual congestion relief. Yes. Well, we've got about a minute left, Panos, and uh, I'd love if you would just address our audience, talk to the individual here, the, the person in Hawaii who's struggling with the cost of living, who's thinking about possibly leaving. Any, any word that you have for the average person here in our state? In my opinion, they shouldn't rush the decision one way or another. Uh, it took me two to three years to do it correctly. I mean, we did it, but it wasn't a rush decision. It was a deliberate decision. It's not an easy move. Uh, they need to uh, find alternative uh, situations, locations, uh, spend time to research if their family and themselves will be happy there and employed, or they will have you know, enough income to sustain themselves in the new location. So uh, rush decisions for this type of, you know, living in Hawaii, traveling away 2,000 miles, spending all this time and, and money on the move, and then the new location is not working out, that would be terrible for the individual. So uh, please spend enough time thinking, asking the right questions and, and uh, investigating if the new location is appropriate. Uh, because for better or worse, Hawaii is a beautiful place and it can work. Uh, but if it's not working, 
the next choice has to be a wise one and, and not one that it was done on a whim uh, because likely it's going to go from one difficult situation to another difficult situation. Well, Panos, thank you very much for those words of wisdom. Thank you for being on the interview today. We miss you here in Hawaii, but through the wonders of telecommunication, we're in touch quite frequently. Much aloha. Aloha to you too. Many thanks. My guest today has been Panos Pervadoris, truly an intellectual who speaks on behalf of the public. We're glad that he was able to join us. Until next time, I'm Kili'i Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii program, Hawaii Together. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.